Now, when we were, uh, as we've been journeying on this series, we've come to the last week of Jesus' life and ministry. And of course, you remember Palm Sunday. He enters into Jerusalem and they are ready to uh, crown him king, to have a coronation that day, to uh, claim him as the Messiah, to let this kingdom get started. They're ready for that. On Monday then... Uh, Jesus uh, comes back into town, and this is the day he curses the fig tree. And, uh, and uh, he, after he curses the fig tree, he goes on into Jerusalem. He cleanses out the temple. And uh, then he is, while he's in the temple, there are some Greeks who come and say, we would see Jesus. And this is the passage we looked at last time we were on this particular series. And uh, when the Greeks said, hey, we want to see Jesus, Jesus said, now it's time for the Son of Man to be delivered over into the hands of men. And it was time for the crucifixion that would take place. And it was built upon that issue of the Greeks saying we would see Jesus. And we talked about that last time. Now, we are on Tuesday morning as we come and continue in this last week of Jesus' ministry. On Tuesday morning, first of all, as they come back into town, Jesus, uh, uh, excuse me, the disciples say, Lord, look at the fig tree which you cursed. It's now dead. He cursed it on Monday. They're walking through noting it's dead on, uh, on Tuesday. Now, because uh, we previously covered the death of the fig tree, we won't go back into that again. And we'll start here on our Tuesday uh, journey as we see Jesus in the temple and he is teaching. And the question here on all the things that are going to happen on this, which really is, in a sense, the last day of Jesus' public ministry, in a sense. It's certainly the last day of his public teaching ministry. He's going to have some private ministry, as he uh, will teach on the Mount of Olives, and he'll teach in the upper room, and lots of teaching that's going to happen. But it's going to be in a small group with his apostles. But here's the last time we'll see Jesus uh, publicly uh, on a teaching agenda. Of course, he's going to be publicly at the uh, crucifixion, and he's going to be publicly at the ascension. But here is the last real bit of public teaching ministry in the life of Jesus as he is here on this earth. And uh, as it comes together, I might say, uh, just let me jump ahead a little bit. It's actually the last bit of public teaching ministry that Jesus will ever have on this earth. Even though he is coming back, he is not coming back to teach. When he comes back, the new covenant will be established. And in the new covenant, nobody goes to his neighbor teaching him the things of the Lord. Why? Because they know it. It's written upon their hearts. And there will be no need to teach anyone. And I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do for a thousand years. But uh, nonetheless, here is uh, Jesus teaching. And as he's teaching, the issue on the day is to challenge his authority. And so they come with some questions about his authority. And the, the, the scribes, the religious leaders, are trying to figure out what to do. On Monday, all the crowd's trying to crown him king. And these people don't want him crowned as king. So what in the world are they going to do to stop it? And so they come up with a question on authority. We see in chapter 21, verses 23 through 27 which I want us just to walk through, uh, if you will, a little bit. And it says, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? That is their question. Now, can I say that in and of itself, that is not a bad question. In and of itself, it is actually a question that the religious leaders indeed had an obligation to ask. As the the, uh, religious leaders and those in charge of the temple, and here's someone teaching in the temple, I need to know, by what authority do you do these things? In fact, in and of itself, it is a question which you ought to either be asking or have asked at some point in the future. I don't want you to just uh, uh, come and say, well... The pastor said, I'm supposed to uh, trust the authority of God. And if God said it, that settles it. We'll leave it at that. No, you need to come and you need to ask of Jesus this same question. By what authority do you do these things? Now, if you've been with us on this uh, long journey of a sermon series, you have seen that Jesus has actually answered that question about two billion times. (laughs) Right? As he's come along. And how many times has he said something like... 
I am from the Father. I have come down from above. The Father and I are one. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you heard it from me, it was words from the Father. If you saw it from me, it was orders from the Father. And he has answered this question in so many ways. At one point, uh, the, the religious leaders questioned him, actually, and he was not uh, answering the question in words. He was displaying the question in his power. You say you're from God? Show us. And that's what the miracles were, by the way, is testimony that Jesus indeed has come down from above. He is of the Father. And so he proved it in all of these miracles. And at one point in, the, in those miracles, he was casting out demons. And the scribes say, well, you think this is proven you're from above? They said, no, it's not. You're actually casting out demons by what? The power of the demons by Beelzebub, the chief of the demons. And you are using demonic power to cast out demonic power. And you remember Jesus said, well, this makes no sense at all. Why would uh, Satan cast out Satan? A house divided against itself can't stand. This, uh, uh, it, just, it just doesn't even make logical sense. And so as you come to this question here in verse 23, it is a legitimate question in and of itself. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Legitimate in and of itself, the problem is they didn't really want the answer. And so this is what I've so many times called an agenda-driven question. And an agenda-driven question, you remember, is not looking for information. It has an agenda that it wants to accomplish. And Jesus was uh, uh, not only uh, the, uh, the, 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 the oft recipient of agenda-driven questions, but you might even be able to say he was the king of answering agenda-driven questions. He knew how to sniff those things out, right? And uh, often you hear someone say, well, Jesus always answered a question with a question. Uh, but that's not completely true. When he did that is when the, uh, there was an agenda, not a question. And so he would turn that back on them as he is about to do here. And I would say to you that Though Jesus is going to come and uh, challenge them in just a moment, if you come with a sincere heart desiring information about Jesus Christ and you come searching for that, there are so many places in the scripture that say, when you search for me, you will what? Find me. If you search for me with all your heart, or uh, draw unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. Or if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives freely and upbraideth not. So many times we could see, if you come and you really do want the information, he is willing and able to give you the information. But if you're not wanting information, you're wanting to trap him, then he's not going to play this game with you. And so Jesus comes to these who are not wanting information at all. And in verse 24, it says, Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you will tell me, I will also tell you but by what authority I do these things. Here's the thing he's going to ask. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? Now, that's his question. You answer that one, I'll answer yours. The baptism of John, from heaven or from men? In a sense, it's the same question they asked Jesus. It's just a different subject. That is, they asked Jesus, from where does your authority come from? And Jesus asked these men, from where does John the Baptist get his authority? Does he get his authority from heaven or does he get his authority from men? It's a, uh, it's a simple question. That uh, they ought a theological question, no doubt, a doctrinal question, but one that the religious leaders ought to answer. And so uh, it goes on in the middle of verse uh, 25. They began reasoning among themselves. That's a first. They began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why didn't you believe him? Uh oh. First of all, that. Uh, that tells an awful lot about these religious leaders, doesn't it? Tells where they were, especially in relation to this uh, message or this testimony of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the religious leaders said, we're not going to repent. 
Maybe some other people need to repent, but we don't need to repent. After all, we're the scribes, we're the Pharisees, we're the priests, we're the religious leaders. There's no repentance needed in us. I'm the ba Baptist pastor. Why in the world would I repent? You even need to repent, but you know, maybe someone needs to repent, but we're not going to repent. So they, they uh, betray themselves here as they say, no, we didn't accept the message of John the Baptist. Maybe they didn't believe, believe they needed to repent. Maybe they didn't believe the kingdom of heaven was at hand. I doubt that one. Maybe they uh, didn't uh, uh, believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and so they, were, they, they didn't mind repenting, but they weren't going to repent for him, uh, for Jesus. Whatever it was, they were rejecting the message of John the Baptist. So if we say, well, he came from heaven why didn't you listen to his message then and we have some problems here and uh, so continuing in verse 26 but if we say from men we fear the people for they all regard John as a prophet this tells us that it's not only politicians who are spineless <laughs> and here's a group of people who were uh, very interested in the votes, in the public opinion, and how things were going to, uh, to, to go here. So they were uh, having a problem. Either way, they went just like Jesus. If he says, I uh, have my authority from above, they'd say, you blaspheme. If, I, if they say, I have my authority from man, then they say, well, we're in charge here then, and our authority comes from the Word of God, so you need to get out of here. So it was a no-win question for Jesus. Jesus gives them a no-win question. And so, going on in verse 27, answering Jesus, I love this answer, they said, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Now, let me ask you, did they know? Indeed, they knew what their opinion was. They knew that they believed he was from man, but they couldn't give it because that was not a politically correct answer, and they were committed to being politically correct. So they opted for we don't know. Now, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, a, a, a number of uh, problems with their we don't know answer. But first of all, just in the fact that in the, uh, in the Jewish uh, religion, as it was given uh, of the Lord anyway, uh, remember back all the way from the beginning with the law, when the, when the people had an issue, uh, they went to whom? To Moses. Moses, tell us the answer. And Moses would give the answer. And uh, then Moses got some advice from his father-in-law, and it was divided up. Uh, and uh, and it, as it turns out then, through the history of Judaism, of course, the people with the answers. You don't know, we got answers. That was the rabbi. And here's the rabbis, the religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people. And they're coming with a theological question and saying, we don't know. That's almost like the unpardonable sin, right, uh, Stuart, uh, for the rabbi to say, I don't know. And uh, I, I think about uh, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, m musicals is Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, Fiddler on the Roof uh, has that, that uh, beginning prologue, whatever that uh, first song is, that uh, talks about the Jewish way and the Jewish custom tradition. And they talk about the tradition of every role within the community. Here's the role of the mama, the role of the papa, the role of the, uh, the son, the role of the daughter, the role of the matchmaker, the role of the beggar. Everybody's got their place within the community. And then they say that... And in the community, the most respected role of all is that of the rabbi. And they talk about how the rabbi spends his time studying the text and they're able to go to him with whatever question they have. This is the role of the rabbi. And uh, incidentally, I like uh, the question they ask the rabbi in Fiddler on the Roof and the answer that he gives. The question is, Rabbi, is there a blessing for the czar? And the rabbi says, a blessing for the czar. Why, of course. May God bless you and keep you far away from us. <laughs> well, the rabbi always has an answer. <laughs> and here they come along and say, we don't know. We don't know. Verse 27, he also said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But he goes on and he gives three stories. We're going to look at two of them today. 
And uh, the, the stories all have to do with this question of authority. First of all, in verses 28 through 32, there's this parable of, of uh, two sons and, and the substance as it relates to authority. What is real obedience and uh, real follow through with, uh, with authority? And so in verse 28, what do you think? He says, a man had two sons and he came to the first and he said, son, go work today in the vineyard. We'll talk about vineyards a little bit here uh, in a moment, but go work in the vineyard. He answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it, and he went. And the man came to the second, and he said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? <laughs> They weren't quite as keen with Jesus because they answer the agenda-driven question. And in verse 31, it goes on to say, They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. Now that answers the question, doesn't it? They say, we don't know. I'll tell you, John came from above. John came in the way of righteousness. And you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe. You're, you're, you're not even as good as that son who, who, was, uh, 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 who was rebellious in the beginning, disrespectful in the beginning, but finally went out and did it. You're not even that rebellious son who eventually comes to obedience. Now, the father is always glad when a rebellious son comes to obedience, right? But the father is even more glad when the son never rebels in the beginning, and he's always obedient. But here he says, you're not even as good as that rebellious son and I suppose uh, he's uh, saying and communicating, you're much more like that son who, who uh, knows to say all the right things. You're very measured in your speech. You're very careful in your speech. And yet, in the end, when it comes to actually doing the things of the Father, you reject them. You turn them aside. You don't do them. And so he says the uh, tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. Uh, I wonder if uh, uh, tax collectors like Matthew, for example, who's writing this. Remember Matthew, Levi, who turned from his tax collecting, or Zacchaeus, who, who uh, re repented of the things that he had stolen, or maybe Mary Magdalene, that uh, prostitute. And so tax collectors and, and uh, prostitutes come along here. I'm not sure which one was more offended to be associated with the other. But Jesus says, they are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven before you. Why? Because even though they had that time of rebellion, they came in the end and they what? They regretted what they did. They turned from what they did. They repented from what they did. You guys, all you're doing is blowing hot air, saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But you never follow through and you never do anything. Now, it goes on in verse 33. And he gives a second parable. And uh, this is the uh, parable uh, which really shows us an attack against authority. And beginning in verse 33, he says, listen to another parable. There was a, a landowner. Let's just stop right there for a moment. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to put together uh, who you think all these people are. But here is a landowner. And uh, I, uh, I believe the uh, King James uh, Version uses the word uh, husbandman, perhaps, uh, as it uh, comes together. And it's, it's one of these words that we don't have a real good English word for. And uh, the, uh, the, the word is uh, uh, oikidespot, oikidespot, one word, oikidespot. But it comes from two Greek words, it's just put together. And oike or oikos is a house, a house. And despot, we get an English word from it. Anyone want to guess what it is? Despot, you're right. Now, a despot in modern English is what? The tyrant, right? Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein would be a despot. Uh, and, and so 
here in modern English, it would be the house tyrant. But Greek, the word despot, didn't have that idea of, 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 of an evil tyranny. All it had was the idea of one man who is in charge of everything. So it said, along comes an oikidespot. That is, one guy who has sole authority over the house and its affairs. So here, uh, the New American Standard has called him a landowner. Uh, but he is the oikidespot. He is the guy who's got the sole authority over everything. And so this oikidespot, he planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and he went on a journey. It's a lot of uh, detail that's given in there, isn't it? And if you begin to look at that detail, what you find is that Jesus here in his parable is actually giving a quote from Isaiah chapter 5, uh, in verse 7 specifically. <clears throat> and uh, as uh, he quotes Isaiah chapter 5, uh, he planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press, and built, uh, built, built a tower. You could go to Isaiah chapter 5, we won't do it today, but you could go back to Isaiah chapter 5 and you could get all the context and you would see that indeed in Isaiah chapter 5 and a number of places in scripture, what you find is that a vineyard in the Hebrew scriptures and even in the, in the New Testament Greek scriptures, the vineyard is a representation of the nation of Israel. Even before this week is out, Jesus is going to gather with his disciples and he's going to say, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the vine dresser, and uh, you need to bear fruit, and if you don't bear fruit, you're cut off. And so this uh, picture of the, the orchidespot, the landowner, uh, the husbandman who plants a vineyard is a picture of God planting Israel, really. You see that from Isaiah 5 and from so many other scriptures. Now, the vineyard being Israel then, it says that he not only planted a vineyard, but he put a wall or a hedge around it. This is where we get that phrase, a hedge of protection. And uh, while it may just mean that God protected Israel as he planted the vineyard in, the, in their own country of Israel, and uh, uh, the, 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 this wall of protection may have just meant protection from his enemies. Actually, I think that it, uh, it goes deeper when you begin to search Scripture and compare Scripture. And what you see is, what is the wall of protection around Israel? And you find that it is the law. God planted the vineyard and he gave them a law to, uh, to, to, to uh, not so much protect them from their enemies as protect them from themselves and their human nature. Because God wanted a distinct nation of Israel. And without the law, Israel would have looked in a few years just like any other country, right? I mean, uh, Moses has gone 40 days and they look just like any other country, right? So the law continually uh, identified them kept them distinct from all the other nations of the world and uh, kept them a vineyard, if you will. So he has a vineyard. He puts a wall around it. Not only does he have a wall around it, but in the vineyard he puts a, a wine press and a tower. Now, maybe he's just giving some illustration of the things that happened, but I think it's not uh, out of the question to say that these also may be uh, a, a type of shadow of something, uh, something in reality, just like the vineyard is not a real vineyard. It's actually the nation of Israel. The landowner is not a real landowner. It's actually God the Father. The uh, wall is not an actual law. It's actually the law. And then you come to the wine press. That's where you take the, the, uh, the wines uh, that are ripe in their season and you press press them down and you get the blood, if you will, that comes out of the grape, the juice from the grape. And it is uh, th therefore then very possible that the wine press is a relation to the altar that God gave to the Jewish people and the tower a relation to the temple that he gave to the Jewish people. Now, I don't know all that for sure. But uh, as you search the scripture, I think you could build an argument here to say he's very much painting a picture of Israel. He's not talking about uh, wine presses and towers and vineyards. He's talking about Israel. And I know so because I've read the end of the chapter, which we'll get to maybe. Now, verse 34. When the harvest time, what? When it approached or drew near. 
when the harvest time approached or drew near. Let me ask you a question. At that point in verse 34, is it harvest time? No. What is it? It's near harvest time. So we're going to send in the servants. They're going to get everything ready. And they're going to harvest as soon as it's harvest time. But uh, you don't harvest prior to harvest time, right? It doesn't make good fruit. And uh, so you want to wait till it's just right. And then you want to be ready. And boom, you want to get it. So it is not harvest time. But harvest time is near. It is, is drawing near. It is approaching. I bring that up because that is actually the same Greek word that is used of John the Baptist all the time when he says, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is, what? It's at hand. At hand. Same Greek word. And uh, typically with John the Baptist in that sermon translated at hand. But does that mean the kingdom of God is there? No, the kingdom of God is approaching. It's drawing near. That you'd have to begin then to say, well, has there ever been a time when the kingdom of God actually was established? You know my opinion on that if you've been around very long. But John didn't say the kingdom of God is here. He said the kingdom of God is drawn near. Here, the harvest time is approaching. Do you remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree on Monday? That uh, he cursed the fig tree even though it was not, what? It was not the season for figs. And that perplexes us as we look at it. And yet... As I mentioned in that sermon, when you put it all together, it is not yet time for Jesus to be crowned as the Messiah and to establish his kingdom. And so he curses that fig tree because they're trying to do it the day before. That's what they wanted to do is establish the kingdom. He's not going to allow that to happen until all the prophecies have uh, been fulfilled. So here in this parable, the harvest time approached. He sent his slaves and his vine growers to receive the produce. And the vine growers took his slaves, beat one, killed another, Stoned a third, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. Perhaps this is a reference to the prophets, perhaps it's a reference to the apostles and the work that they are going to do. And if you look uh, through the history of either one of those, uh, you'll see that uh, indeed this is the, uh, the, the response, even through scripture, the response that uh, was often given to the prophets. And so in verse 37 it says, but afterwards... He sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. I want to give you a Sunday school question, and I want the Sunday school answer. Who is this son? Jesus. You don't have to be a theological rocket scientist, do you, to figure out how all of this is coming. And uh, you don't even have to do the work and say, well, vineyard here is Israel and here is Israel, and so it must, be, it must be talking about Israel. When you get to this point, it's very clear he's talking about Israel and their reception of, uh, of Jesus as their Messiah as it comes along and the ultimate uh, crucifixion of Jesus. And so uh, here is uh, this word that they say, hey, this is the heir, the heir. What does an heir receive? He receives that which was his father's, right? And in this case, the, uh, in the immediate context of the parable, the inheritance is the vineyard. And so these laborers in the vineyard are saying... We want this vineyard for ourselves. We don't just want to work here. We want to own this vineyard. Now, put this in context. Who's he talking to? Scribes, elders, Pharisees. And what, uh, what do they want? They want Jesus dead. Why? Because the people want Jesus to be their Messiah. The uh, religious leaders don't want Jesus to be their Messiah. A number of reasons for it, but one of the reasons I think you'd have to say is because they want all the leadership and all of the control. They want the vineyard. Zechariah gives another 
uh, illustration of the coming religious leaders when he gives a prophecy and he says that there will be a good shepherd and there will be a host of evil shepherds. And the evil shepherds are going to come and try to take the sheep. And you need to be careful and you need to go for the good shepherd, not for the others. So here's these labors of the vineyard and they want the inheritance. Now, in the context of the parable, the inheritance, of course, is the vineyard. But we know that the son is going to inherit that which is of the father. And the son here is is Jesus and the inheritance then that he will receive is what? Well, there's a number of uh, scriptures that you could look into, but I'll just read one of them to you. De Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32 verse 9 where it says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Now, Jacob's name was turned to what? Israel. Israel is the allotment of his inheritance. You could uh, read a number of other scriptures. Uh, Isaiah chapter 19 verse 25 says the same thing. And there are probably a dozen at least, a dozen times in the, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures in which it says Israel is the inheritance uh, uh, of God. Now, if that's God's inheritance and his son is going to get it, then what is his son going to get? Israel, the vineyard. And these other leaders say, we want the vineyard. So let's kill the son, put him out, and we'll end up getting the vineyard. It's not going to work out for him so well, but that's their desire anyway. And so they say, come, let us kill him, seize his inheritance. Verse 39, they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Jesus, in a sense, is giving a prophecy, but it's nothing new uh, because he had already told him, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be uh, uh, arrested by the uh, religious leaders, then I'm going to be turned over to the Romans, they're going to crucify me and bury me, and I'll rise again on the third day. And so here, indeed, is what's going to happen before the week is out. They are going to, those laborers of the vineyard, they're going to take him and throw him out of the vineyard outside of the city walls, and they're going to kill him. Verse 40, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they didn't learn their lesson about answering agenda-driven questions. They said to him, verse 41, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds when? In their season, at the proper time. Now, very interesting passage of uh, Scripture. As this is the, the, this is the uh, scribes, of the religious leaders speaking what is truth here. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. You could just footnote 70 A.D. Check that out in your history. And will rent out that vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds when? At proper season. Uh, it's uh, translated in First uh, Timothy, I believe, in due season. When it's time, wasn't a time for figs, wasn't a time for grapes, but when it's time, guess what? There is going to be a, a, a people who will give him the fruit of his vineyard. And his vineyard is Israel. And so he's going to give this to, to, to a, a people is how New American Standard puts it. Uh, to a people who will, uh, 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 let's see, I lost my place here, uh, rent out the vineyard and other, and who, will, who will pay him at the uh, end of time, excuse me, at their proper season. Now, who is this? Uh, okay, I jumped ahead. That's why it's down in verse 43. Uh, so let's do verse 42 and we'll come back there. How's that? Jesus said to them, do you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. It's marvelous in our eyes. Here's another question. Don't you read from the scriptures this? Now, let me ask you a question. Of course, you're a, a Christian living after the fact. It's a little easier for you to see. But who is the stone which the builders rejected, which becomes the chief cornerstone? Jesus. And 
this, this uh, scripture, actually, that Jesus is quoting is from the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verse 22. Do you ever read that? I, I, I don't know. I'm going to make something up because it's not here in the scripture. But I suppose this. Well, of course, we, we've read that. Psalm 118, verse 22. We sing it here in the temple all the time. It is a celebration of the future when the, uh, the, the, the kingdom will be established and becomes the chief cornerstone. And this will come about by the Lord. It'll be marvelous in our eyes. Sure, we do that. And he says, yeah, okay, so you understand the part about the kingdom that's coming. I want to talk to you about the part, the stone which the builders rejected. That's where I want to focus because that's exactly what you builders are doing. And it's a losing proposition. So it goes on in verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. When are they going to produce the fruit of it? Before it's time? No. When it's time. In due season. You know, interesting, uh, and if I had another hour, I would talk about this. Uh, but do you know that uh, Paul says that he was born, you remember, saved uh, uh, before, t before due time. He was premature, he says. Was not seasoned. And he says he is a pattern for, for uh, the Gentiles, for the church today. Born out of due season. And it's a word that never means late. It always means early. Is born early. You know why? It's not the season yet. The season is yet to come. And when that time comes, there will be a people who will give him the fruit of his vineyard. Guess who those people are going to be? Israel. And Israel will come to the place in which they uh, give the Lord his fruit. They will mourn him whom they have pierced. They will, uh, they, they will uh, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All of Israel will be saved. There will come that time when uh, he will receive his inheritance. His inheritance hasn't changed. His inheritance is and always will be Israel. And, uh, uh, and there are several times in the scriptures where there were people beginning to worry, saying, hey, it looks like you're not going to get it. And what's Jesus say? All that the Father gives me, I will receive. I will not lose any of it. It'll all come to me. I'm going to get my inheritance. Right now, it's not the season. When the season arrives, there is going to be a, a people who produce the fruit of it. And this is something in my theology that is yet to come. Now, so many times people say, look, it was, uh, the kingdom was taken away from Israel and it was given to the church. It's called replacement theology, by the way. But uh, the, uh, they, they say this because it uses the word ethnos there. It will be given to an ethnos producing the fruit of it. And ethnos is, is many times in the scripture actually translated in our English Bibles as Gentiles. And so it'll be given to the Gentiles. The problem is ethnos doesn't uh, in and of itself mean Gentiles. It, it means ethnos. We get ethnicities from it. And uh, 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 Jews happen to be an ethnos. Did you know that? And uh, Gentiles, uh, you know, Romans, Italians, whatever it is. Uh, I guess Romans and Italians are the same thing, aren't they? Uh, uh, whatever uh, all, all, of, uh, all of us are, we're, we're an ethnos. And it'll be given to an ethnos. Now, do you know, however, that we are the church and the church is the body of Christ in which there is neither, what? Jew nor Greek. We're not an ethnos. There's no color with us. There, there's no, no, no difference in nationality. We're all one. In fact, not even male, female, rich, poor, slave, free, none of us. Why? Because we're one body. How could we be, uh, you know, all these different things? We're not. We're, we're the body of Christ. And someday the body of Christ will be taken away from here. And God is going to begin again to deal specifically with an ethnos. And that ethnos is going to be the one that produces the fruit and it is at that time that the Lord will receive his inheritance. Now, let's uh, conclude this. It says in verse 45, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his, his uh, parables, they understood he was speaking about them. Now, I, I just use that to say, see, everything I told you is true. 
This really is about Israel. It really is about uh, her Messiah and her kingdom and her religious leaders. Those who were there had no mistake about it that this was about them. And so what they do? They sought to seize him. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. But they, on Tuesday morning, are beginning to work overtime. And by Thursday night, they're going to have him arrested. And by Friday, they're going to cast him out of the gates and have him crucified. And you'll have to wait then for the rest of the story. Now, as you come, you consider issues like the authority of Jesus. Where does his authority come? It's my prayer that you've come like me and said, I know where his authority comes from. It comes from the Father. He is of the Father, and I give myself to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for these instructive parables. And even, even in our day... In this age of grace, we see individuals who reject the authority of Jesus Christ. I pray, rather, we would see more and more people who are asking questions, legitimately searching the scriptures for answers, desiring to know, knowing that the Spirit will use the Word of God to give them the information, and I pray that then they would come and they would bow down and say, my Lord and my God. Thank you for that experience of grace that I've had and so many others here. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.